My team and I have seen firsthand the kinds of things that can go wrong when a curious new user wants to make the switch to Linux. One of the biggest takeaways that we all had from Linus's experience in his uh, Daily Driver Challenge series is that the resources out there for someone who's trying to make that switch on their own don't seem that great. Don't get me wrong, there is some great community help, and if you want to ask for help, you can. But what about the people who are too afraid to ask for help? So I wanted to change all of that. Here's a clear and I'm hoping simple list of three main things that you should consider before you make the switch. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll be able to make an informed decision about which Linux distribution is right for you. But before we get to any of that, let's have a word from our sponsor. I want to say thank you to Micro Center for sponsoring this video. If it isn't already, Micro Center should be your first stop for all things tech, whether it's electronics, computers, PC components, networking, or communication devices. Micro Center has over 30,000 items in stock to suit your needs. Whether online or in store, you'll be hard pressed to beat their prices too. And Micro Center's team of friendly and knowledgeable associates have the skills it takes to help you complete any PC or electronics project. As schools and businesses have shifted away from in-person meetings and become more online oriented, Micro Center is the only place that you need to stop when it comes to webcams, microphones, networking gear, upgrades for your computer, and more. Plus, with Micro Center's new online community, you can now tap into the expertise of like-minded enthusiasts just like you. Right now, Micro Center is offering new customers a free SSD. That's right, get a free 240 gigabyte SSD and find out how using my link in the description. Limitations apply. And thank you to Micro Center for sponsoring this video. The first thing that you're gonna to wanna to consider before you do anything else is pretty simple. Think about your hardware. What kind of hardware do you have? Do you have any specialized audio equipment? Do you have an exotic mouse or keyboard? Are there any peripherals that you rely on which need special software in order to be used or configured? Now, if you answered yes to one or more of those questions, there's a good chance that things might not work 100% for you after you install Linux on your machine. That's because, generally speaking, Linux typically comes with almost every driver that you could want out of the box, aside from a few things like Nvidia's graphics drivers and some weird printer stuff. But if you have a PCI or USB device that's, let's say, aimed at gamers, chances are good that it won't have official support for Linux. That isn't to say that it's not going to work, though. And in many cases, it's really easy to test, actually. Just download a copy of your Linux OS of choice, and we'll talk about that in a minute, and then make a bootable USB disk with the ISO using Rufus or Belina Etcher, and then boot from it. Most Linux OSs will actually allow you to test drive the system from the USB stick before you install it. And by doing this, you can actually check that your audio and your Wi-Fi are working. It might be a little bit more complicated to test uh, something like an Elgato Stream Deck and the like from a USB live environment, but that's where Google will come in handy. Typically, you can type in something like Elgato Stream Deck Linux or Elgato Stream Deck and then the name of your distribution. And more often than not, you'll find the answer that you're looking for, but that's assuming that there's actually an answer to be found. Sadly, sometimes devices just aren't supported on Linux, and it'll be up to you to decide if you're willing to live with that. The thing is, I'm a diehard Linux user who has been using desktop Linux on every one of his computers for the last decade. And because of that, I have deliberately avoided devices that won't work on my preferred operating system. But I understand that that's not everyone's experience. It should also be noted that if you have a popular enough device, there's a good chance that someone else has created unofficial support if it didn't already exist. Either by creating a third-party driver, which can often natively unlock features that are restricted to the vendor management software on Windows, or by maintaining an app that lets you customize your device. In many instances, this enthusiast-created software will actually make managing your devices much easier. Take something like OpenRGB, for example. It allows you to manage every supported RGB device on your system, no matter which vendor or RGB standard it uses, within a single app. Before we continue, I wanted to let you know that I made this video with the idea of sending this to uh, your friends who are trying to move over from Windows or maybe even Mac OS. If you have a friend who's trying to make that switch, maybe send them this video and help them out. Thanks. So next up, we need to talk about software packages. Now, software delivery on Linux is quite different from how it works on Windows. You might be thinking, well, how different can it be? But let's just put it this way. Linux beat iOS and Android to the App Store model of software distribution by over a decade, except every app in the Linux app stores are free. 
Your Linux OS comes with something called a package manager, which consists of a graphical user interface and a command line interface. And all of the software on your computer, I'm talking all of it, from the user interface to the Linux kernel itself, is installed and updates are managed by the packages through this package manager. Now, I'm explaining all of this because it bears repeating. The way you get your software on Linux is by downloading it through your package manager. On most Linux OSs, the software in the package manager is built specifically for your Linux distro by the people who made it. That means that software for Ubuntu is built for Ubuntu by Canonical, the company that owns Ubuntu. And with few caveats, the software for Manjaro is built for Manjaro by Manjaro. The same is true for Pop! OS and most other distros as well. And this is possible because virtually all of the software is free and open source. So it's a rare occasion that you would go download an executable file from some random website. But then how do you get software that isn't available in your distro software repository, or repo for short? Well, there are software packages that you can install from the web. They come in a variety of formats. There's .deb for Ubuntu, Pop! OS, and Elementary, and there's Snap for Ubuntu. And then there are flat packs and app images that will just work out of the box on pretty much any Linux distribution out there. But what if the version of your app available in your Linux distro's repository is seriously out of date? And another question is, why would it ever be out of date? Well, you're likely to encounter a situation like this if you're using a Linux distribution that's focused on stability. This is because, as I said before, every piece of software for your OS comes through the package manager. And if a software package is stable and it doesn't have any security issues, then it's probably not going to get updated until the next major release of the OS. But then you have other distributions out there like Manjaro. Manjaro uses cutting edge packages with regular updates. And this can be a double edged sword as you might sacrifice a bit of stability for new features more often. So this is something that you'll want to keep in mind when choosing your Linux distribution. Are you looking for a rock solid OS that might have slightly older packages? Use something like Ubuntu or something based on it like Pop or Elementary. If you're looking for a more cutting edge experience, I'd recommend something like Manjaro, especially if you have an AMD graphics card, since the newest drivers are going to be built into the Linux kernel and you want frequent updates. All right, let's talk about desktop environments. This is the final thing that I think is important for you to consider before you make the switch. What desktop do you want to use? What we in the Linux community call a desktop environment. There are many to choose from, but I would recommend sticking with either GNOME, Pantheon, or KDE Plasma. First up is KDE Plasma. This is the desktop environment that the Steam Deck is going to be using when you leave Steam. This has several advantages to other DEs, but also some drawbacks. So let's talk about the pros. Plasma is fast, like really fast. In benchmarking, KDE tends to have the lowest overhead and the best performance for gaming. It also might seem familiar to people who already use Windows, and it's all about customization. But it's definitely not perfect. Plasma has an objectively less polished and less refined user experience. In my opinion, it's pretty rough around the edges. I think it's also a less suitable option for people who are brand new to Linux. And it also reportedly has worse multi-monitor support for the three options on this list. Next up is Pantheon. Pantheon is the desktop environment of Elementary OS. Elementary's focus is on the user experience and the design and usability of the OS. And let's talk about the pros then. Pantheon has a hyper focus on usability, and as a consequence, it looks and feels great. It's also a good option for new Linux users. So how about the cons then? Elementary is the only distribution that ships Pantheon. It's also considerably less customizable than Plasma. All right, finally, let's talk about GNOME. Now, I have to be honest, GNOME is my preferred desktop environment. It's simply the most refined and straightforward UI. They focus on usability and the way the UI elements behave is consistent across applications. Plus, its design is a great middle ground between established desktop paradigms while also forging its own unique identity. In terms of pros, GNOME is the best and most user-friendly desktop environment for new users. GNOME has a superb interface and a fantastic user experience. There is wide support across Linux distros, which means that there's a lot of documentation and QAs out there already. It has the most polish of any Linux desktop environment, and it also has terrific multi-monitor support. The cons, though, are that it's not particularly customizable, and in benchmarks, it has been slightly less performant than Plasma. Some folks compare its design to a mobile UI or macOS, though I don't see those as particularly 
bad. <laughs> None of these are deal breakers. If you're not satisfied with the options I've laid out here, you're welcome to do your own research, as there are many desktop environments available for Linux. But I think that if you're new to Linux, GNOME, Pantheon, and KDE are good places to start. And notice that I said start here. No matter where you start from, it doesn't have to be where you end up. If you try GNOME and you end up not liking it, there's nothing stopping you from giving KDE Plasma a spin. So the final question is this, which Linux distro should you choose? Now, I can't answer that for you, but I think I can offer you a narrowed down option that's informed by years of experience with Linux. The following is my list of distributions that I think are good for Linux beginners. First up, we have Ubuntu. Now, it's the granddaddy of user-friendly Linux distros. Its main spin has GNOME as its desktop environment, which is a plus, but it's also rather slow with updating non-critical software packages, and its reliance on snap packages makes it kind of a nightmare for me in my uh, use cases. Next up, we have Pop! OS. Now, Pop! OS is a distro that comes from hardware manufacturer System76, which, in full disclosure, I have a working relationship with. But that really doesn't change my opinion of their operating system. Pop! utilizes GNOME as its desktop environment, and while it's based on Ubuntu and has slightly older packages, it also offers the much more widely supported Flatpak format, which is available through its Pop! shop, and that helps address the software age issue. Pop! OS also offers two versions. There's one for AMD graphics cards, and there's one for NVIDIA. This is super helpful for new users, as you don't need to fuss with installing drivers after you're done with the first install. Next up, we have Elementary OS. Elementary is all about the user experience, and it offers a pretty good one at that. It uses Pantheon as its desktop environment and makes flat packs available through its App Center. Finally, we have my preferred option, Manjaro. This is the distro that I use on most of my PCs. It has up-to-date packages, but also allows you to install additional software through the Arch user repository, as well as flat packs. Manjaro offers KDE Plasma as a desktop environment, but they also offer a GNOME version, and that's what I both use personally and what I recommend. Manjaro is slightly more advanced than other distros on this list, but if you have an AMD graphics card in particular, it's probably your best choice in my opinion. Well, that's everything that I have to say about this topic, but uh, I'd love to know what you think. Do you agree with my recommendations? Let me know in the comments below. I want to give a special shout out to my YouTube members and my patrons, all of whom make what I do here possible. If it wasn't for you guys, we wouldn't have been able to grow this show into what it is today. And I want to say thank you. If you believe in the work that I'm doing here and you want to help this show grow, consider becoming a patron or a YouTube member. There are links below. Don't forget to hit that like button and leave a comment and let me know what you're thinking. But that's going to do it for now. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all in the next one.